80% of all illness is either caused or exacerbated by stress. Now, when I look at entrepreneurs in their 20s and 30s, they have blood pressures of people in their 70s. When you're going against yourself, you're not gonna win. It's no secret that how you handle stress has a big impact on your health. Burnout is one of those things that doesn't go away. It's actually been declared a legitimate medical diagnosis. Dr. Neha Sangwan. Dr. Neha Sangwan, internal medicine physician and international speaker and burnout and communication expert. Exhaustion, cynicism, and ineffectiveness, that's the definition of burnout. Exhaustion is the key, but it's not short-term exhaustion. You've been adjusting for months and years, and then something comes in that's like a undertow cynicism. It's that thought in your mind that just kind of creeps in and goes, doesn't matter how hard I work, I'm never going to really make a difference here. And lastly, you become ineffective. So tell me where you are. I so desperately need your help today. Welcome to another episode of Unlock Your Potential. Jeff Lerner, your host. Always so excited to be back with you, having amazing conversations with amazing human beings. Today, we are joined by Dr. Neha Songwon, who has given me permission to just call her Neha. You uh, bet. <laughs> although she is she is an esteemed doctor. Um, but anyway, uh, Neha is here. She is the CEO and founder of Intuitive Intelligence, uh, an internal medicine physician, a speaker, corporate communication expert, uh, TED talker. Um, and honestly, super interesting, very aligned person with everything that we're about here on the show. Um, and she's, I'll let her obviously tell, tell the story, but she, you know, came out of traditional medicine and now does uh, private practice and corporate consulting work around communication organizations, um, and, and how sort of the body, mind, soul, heart, spirit, mission, vocation, all that stuff aligns and sometimes gets tangled up a little bit. Um, so Neha, <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. What an honor. Thank you. I um, so I'll I'll, c I'll come in with the audience exactly the way I came in with you just a few moments ago, which is, I think the universe put us together today, um, it, especially in a format where technically you know it's my show, I get to steer the questions because <laughs> I so desperately need your help today. <laughs> um, Love it. I am having a day where communication the the pressures of of leadership and having to keep track of all the moving parts of an organization and you know all the different things that impact what i'm ultimately trying to accomplish are creating conf and, and I, I suppose the audience can relate to this in a lot of on many days they're creating confusion they're creating stress they're confusing creating brain fog a sense of of like overwhelm that makes me want to just sort of go throw my hands up um, and, and even a lot of physiological, like frustration and high blood pressure and like, I'm, I'm in it today. So let's maybe start there. And in the context of whether it's me or anybody else that's experiencing such things, um, actually let's back up. How did you even get into the practice of dealing with such things before we actually go to how you deal with them? Sure. 20 years ago, um, so I'm I'm a middle daughter of Indian immigrants, and so growing up, my dad wanted me to be a son who was an engineer. I happened to be a daughter, uh, but I could do the engineering piece. My mom missed her calling for medicine, and so I thought everybody can just stop fighting, like no no disagreement here. I'll do both. So I'm a mechanical and biomedical engineer. I worked for Motorola in the '90s when Motorola was the thing. Uh, internal medicine physician, and 33 years old. One day I walked into the hospital and I said to the nurse about five hours into my shift, I said, hey, Nina, can you uh, give 40 mil equivalents of IV potassium to the gentleman in 636? She said, Dr. Sangwan, are you okay? And I said, yeah, why? And she said, that's the fourth time you've asked me that same question in under five minutes and I've answered you every time. It was the day that I just hit the ball, the wall of burnout. And that changed everything for me because I think up until then, I was really a human doing. And I was pretty sure that my mind, that I could push through my body, not partner with it. Hmm. And that day I learned that there was a limit, even though my training taught me that I should, you know, pee when I can, eat when I can, sleep when I can. Uh, and just serve other people in their crisis and their emergency, that day I realized the importance of taking care of me and that stress was a real thing and that I was not superhuman. 
And it was just a real reality check. And I was off for three months on medical leave. And that's where I started Googling. And I wasn't really Googling back then, but I was looking up um, what's at the root of our illness, right? And I found research showing me that more than 80% of all illness is either caused or exacerbated by stress. And when I realized that, I thought, oh my gosh, I think this explains why sometimes there's physical illness that truly has a physical cause. And the other times, it's something unresolved on a mental, emotional, social, spiritual level that's showing up in our physical body as headaches, as chronic insomnia, as all these other things, gut issues, that actually is something unresolved on a mental, emotional, social, spiritual level. And so I've spent the last 20 years helping people heal from burnout, realizing how little I knew about burnout, but everybody gets sent to me for a burnout. And so now that's that's why I wrote a book. That's why that's how I got here. I realized that, you know, I went back in and told my colleagues, hey guys, you know, stress causes or exacerbates more than 80% of all illness. So when our patients are stabilized in the hospital, why don't we ask them before they're discharged, what's at the root of their stress? And my colleagues said to me, just like you wouldn't order a test that you don't know what to do with the answer, why would you ask a question that you, or you, why would you order a test that you didn't know what to do with the result? Why would you ask a question that you didn't know what to do with the answer? And I thought, because people are depending on us, that's why. And so I've made that my mission for two decades. Hmm. So, man, it, b b burnout. I uh, have so many different, so many different places we can go with the subject. So, yeah, I did. It, God, because I, I feel, I, and actually, I, you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll surrender to you. I feel like so. Here's what's coming to mind. Right? We can talk about why the medical establishment is the way it is. I feel like it's one of a num a number of like meta institutions in our society that are, to some degree let's call it antiquated in their thinking, right? Or, or, or resistant to a more, you know, diversified approach or however we want to label it. That's one subject. Then there's what's going on at the, at the root of the sort of archetypal American or even like, you know, global citizen who's experiencing that 80, you know, who, who gener who creates those statistics, right? The people that are themselves experiencing physio physiological, manifestations of psychological or spiritual or, or emotional problems or challenges. So that's an interesting subject. Uh, and then there's the whole, what do we do about it subject? I don't know. Where where do you feel like we should go to try to unpack this the most for the audience who, you know, as a, as a generalization is probably experiencing a lot of what you're describing because it's an audience that is very entrepreneurial. A lot of people listen to my show, own their own businesses. And you and I both know, ain't no much more stress than that. So... <laughs> entrepreneurial world. It's like you want to change the world. You have the spirit and you see the vision and you want to go for it. And then you meet all the obstacles in the way that you never saw. And then it's about your vision and your passion being stronger than your fear and the stress and the overwhelm. Mm -hmm. So I say we just touch on them. So I'm going to touch on the medical system. And what I'll tell you is I am grateful for the traditional medical system. It is crisis care focused. Yeah. You must be in crisis. You get in an accident, break a bone. You are sick and need an antibiotic. You are in crisis. That's the place to go. You're burning out and you literally are doing what I did, which was become ineffective where I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Thank God that nurse caught me. And thank God she gave me a wake up call because I could have done something pretty damaging that day and not known. Right. So I think the lesson there is traditional medicine, conventional medicine is really good in crisis. So don't throw it all out. It's amazing when you need me to write you a script so you get paid time off because right. you need it. It's really great when you haven't been able to sleep, you have anxiety, you have depression, and you're in a panic attack, you're in crisis, you're feeling you're like you're sinking. I can give you some meds to help temper that and help you get to a place where you can be more resourceful. So let's talk about the usefulness of it. Now, when people think that they can use the traditional medicine, medical system to take care of chronic illness, um, 
ongoing. They want to move up from burnout or, or illness to prevention. We were never taught that in medical school. So don't look to me for food, for supplements, for prevention, unless I've done training in functional medicine, unless I've had my own crisis, which I have, and written a book on burnout and all of this. That means something's happened to me that's motivated me to learn all of that. So I want people to know, if you're going to your conventional general practitioner and you're trying to get nutritional supplements and food recommendations and things, unless they've learned it on their own time, and it's their own passion. We never learned that. We didn't even learn about burnout. So what I'd say there is you want naturopathy, you want functional medicine, you want other ways that look at the body as a whole system, not like, oh, you have a heart condition, you go to a cardiologist. Oh, you have a skin condition, you go to a dermatologist. Oh, that's all separate. But there's practices that actually integrate everything like a hormonal system, immune system. How does my gut not being well or a parasite in my gut give me skin issues? Yeah. That's not a steroid cream deficiency, right? It's it's something's wrong in my gut and it, I need to have somebody who's seeing the connections between things. So that's number one. If somebody's struggling with a physical ailment that's not acute, you might be going to the wrong place to find the help. If it's acute, go to your traditional doctor. So is yeah. that helpful? Is it no, yeah, that's no, that's totally great. I, I, at risk of veering off on a tangent, I'm still going to ask the question that's that's on my mind, which is, how much of that is a reverse design flaw? Let's say a design flaw from from a reversal of incentives, where the incentive is. Like the medic, like medicine is expensive, right? There's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of ex fancy equipment and nice buildings and whatnot, and all that has to be paid for. And the yeah. only thing, the only thing, and essentially the acute intervention model, is the only way to do it in a way where there's enough urgency to create enough perceived value to create enough willingness to pay what it costs to sustain the system. How much of what you're describing is actually a function of of the incentives of like? you know, the insurance model and and even like the consumer, almost like behavioral economics of what people are willing to pay for and when. So whenever I'm talking about something complicated, I think of it in a me, we world interaction. Okay. okay. Individuals, my patients, there are some people who want to change their food habits, exercise, do things differently with lifestyle. But I'll tell you, a majority of patients that come in, they want me to give them a quick fix. They're there. They only came in once it was an emergency. They ignored it five other times, but they showed up when it prioritized, you know, in some way they got scared, right? And so they made their doctor's appointment. So one thing I'd say is, Yes to, okay, so then let's say oftentimes in our society, in the in the U.S., we really want a quick fix, all right? And even in the world. Then I would go to the we piece of this. I think when we discovered microbes and there was this thing outside us that got in us that we could kill like a video game, right? Like we could attack it. Everybody's like, Oh my gosh, there's these things. We can do something about them and and started going down the whole pharmaceutical experience, right? Then that's when antibiotics and all these things came in. I'd say also in the 60s, 70s, the food industry is a part of this where they wanted food preserved on the shelf for longer so they could make more money. And so now you're giving me high fructose corn syrup, you're giving me trans fat, you're giving me all these things that sweeten and preserve food on the shelf. I'm like a 70s baby. I was busy eating Bisquick and Ritz and Ritz crackers and all these things. Had no idea that there was trans fat in them. We didn't even know the effects of it, right? We didn't know that when you put, you, you basically, it's hydrogenation, but when you put an inert substance, something that can't break apart, to keep something preserved, guess what? If it doesn't break apart on the shelf, if it doesn't rot, if it doesn't go bad, it doesn't break down in my body either. Right, right. And so we kind of miss some of these. I'd then say this insurance which, idea. Which as a, just as yeah. a visual, that's why that's arteriosclerosis. That's why it it scrapes your arteries is because it's 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 like a it's like introducing a 
a piece of little piece of quartz into your body. It's going to scratch things up. Well, yeah, you can't, you really can't digest it. It gets stuck in you. That's like an easy way to say it in your arteries in all sorts of places, right? If you can't digest something, where's it going to go? Right. And so there's places like Australia and other places that have literally banned trans fat places in the U S too, certain New York city, other places. So we have gotten wise on the damage for that. Then I would say, here's what I like about the medical system. Diagnostic testing. That made things really expensive. But here's the deal. My God, if someone can see inside you without cutting you open, pretty miraculous. So that's another thing that I'd say I use the traditional health system for. When I testing, blood tests, scans, all of that, really helpful. I know a lot about medicine. So then I use that information to figure out where I go next, right? And I understand that a lot of people don't. Okay. So then there's the insurance system that came in that is paying per procedure, right? And paying per uh, per surgery and per this. And yeah, that's a sick care model. That's a sick care model where they're going to get paid. And of course, we can charge more for emergency department and all of that care, a lot more than we could charge for routine prevention. Okay. It's a me, we world. So that's the healthcare world. And so, so that, to that, inter- to that insurance point, and I always, uh, I, I, there's a larger sort of theme I'm trying to tap into here, which is, you know, really short-sightedness. I, I basically believe that most of what's wrong in the world is because human beings were still anthropologically and, and biologically wired to, to be short, you know, I would say ineffectively short-term thinkers. Uh, yeah. B- but that- that that me- that financial model, especially as it regards insurance, is insurance is based on, and I would say an arbitrage between the perceived value of an asymmetrical uh, acute intervention and the actual long term value of the dollars that you contribute as premiums. In other words, people are willing to pay in all, their whole life into this thing because theoretically, there's going to be a moment in time. When if they can do a thing in a short period of time, however much it costs, it will it will change the tra- trajectory of their life and their quality of life will be different after versus before. And they'll, for the rest of their life, they'll realize that benefit. And therefore, it can cost what it costs. And people were willing to have been paying for it that whole time up to that point. That That's the incentive model of insurance. But I, I, I would argue that Everything you just described only works because we as human beings accept a short-term thinking paradigm for our life. Yeah, and we aren't really often willing to get uncomfortable and change behaviors and do things differently. We we And we want a quick fix. When we go to somebody, we actually want a quick fix. So there's a part of it that's us as well and a society that's expecting oh, I, something as well. I think it's, I actually, I, I'm, I'm going to go so far as to say it is us, not as <laughs> well. They only exist by the consent of the governed or the consent of the insured or the consent of the, of the patients. Like it's all us. That's right. And I will say, if you go listen to hundreds of my episodes of this show, you will find a theme of like, stop thinking so short term, stop being such a like 50,000, you know, year old evolved species that evaluates the choice to go to either stay in the cave or go out of the cave as if there's a saber toothed tiger out there that's going to eat us. We don't live in that world anymore. We should stop thinking that way. But evolution is slow. So. Yeah. And, you know, the joke in medicine is that medicine evolves the death of one physician at a time. Like that's how it works. Mm. But I would, another thing is just in a really simplistic way, our brain, there's neuroscientists on, you know, listening, they're not going to like what I'm going to say, but really on the most basic level, the function of the brain is to seek pleasure and avoid pain. If I just simplify it. And so what happens is we can often be pretty reactive about things. We don't want to sit in the discomfort of not knowing, of of doing something different, of changing behaviors. It's biologically wired into us um, to avoid that pain, right? And self-awareness, listening to, thank God podcasts have exploded and people are learning and there's all these free ways to 
expand our perspective. But you know when I told you that whenever I think about solving a complex problem like burnout, I think of it, people say, oh, is burnout your fault? No, burnout's not your fault and it's not a personal failure. It's a wake-up call telling you that the coping mechanisms, strategies, relationships, job you're in, whatever it is, you've outgrown it. And now it's time to use different ways of being for the next leg of the race. That's it. And so it's telling you you've exhausted all these probably amazing ways that you figured out how to keep it all going. And then when you burn out, it's like, oh, wake up call. I realized, you know, two ice cold Mountain Dews plus a king size Snickers bar got me to 33 and overnight shifts. It wasn't going to get me to 53. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you start to, in the moments we got, are in crisis, here's what's beautiful about it. I've seen this so many thousands of times with my patients in the hospital. Someone has a heart attack, a stroke, a pneumonia, gets in an accident, whatever it is. In that moment, what matters to them becomes crystal clear. They know what they value. They know in what order they value it. They know what they've missed. It's actually what I consider Many doctors engage with people at that moment and on a physical and intellectual level, like, hey, this is what's happening. Here's where the blockage was. Oh, no. My big thing was that's a sacred moment because somebody just woke up to what they've been missing in their life. And I think we do that with any crisis. We lose someone unexpectedly. We go through a global pandemic. We have a breakdown in our health. We are at this point, like you described today, like, you got on and you're like, I am really struggling today. I mean, how many other people are going to be like, he is speaking to me, you know, mm -hmm. and you get to they, you get to have community in it, but you also get to have healing in it. And so the question is, right, um, how can we, you know, sort through that when it's us and how do we do what we need to to get what we need to? And I say, know where you're headed and who now if people want to expand their perspective they should be coming here right they if they want to hear authenticity if they want to feel connected to a human who's going to tell you where he really is right now it's right here right if you're in an emergency hey, you're heading to the er and you're grateful for it mm -hmm. right so we just got to know like what works where and what do we use when because if we're abusing a system, we're not doing preventative care, we're not taking care of ourselves, and then we use the ER as the backup, yeah, someone's going to make money for that. You bet. So we said we were going to sort of jump or, you know, hop yeah, through the, the scenario. So we, I, I feel like, you know, we did a good touch on the medical system. There's, We could do a whole podcast there, I'm sure. sure. Um, but yeah, next was, well, we're, I guess you take us take us where we go from there. I think what you were saying was really about, we were talking, like, how do you really get to burnout, I want to say? Like, you said, like, the system, like, the burnout, and then how we heal it, you know? Yeah. Is kind exactly. of how I got, how I, uh, so I would love to, if you're open to it, um, why don't we, why don't we do something real? Instead of me, let me, I'll just tell people what burnout is and how to think through it. And then let's talk about you and it, see if oh, yeah. we can help you shift. And that, to me, would be really effective because, you know, practical tools and solutions. I wrote a book. It's called Powered by Me from Burned Out to Fully Charged at Work and in Life. I demystify burnout. I personalize it to the, the reader. And then I give you powerful, practical tools. I created a website. I give you exercises, videos, all this stuff. Okay. So we'll give them resources. What I think right now is, let me just give them a quick overview. What is burnout? Burnout is a triad. This is how it's defined. Physical, mental, emotional exhaustion. Exhaustion is the key, but it's not short-term exhaustion. It's you've been you've been adjusting for months and years. Your physiology has you've been using you know take a glass of wine after work to take the edge off, and maybe now it's three glasses, right? Like this has been progressing for a while. You walk up, get up in the morning, and it used to be, hey, I just need to grab a cup of coffee. Now it's like make it a double. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's all these ways that you've been changing over time, your heart, you know, your blood pressure, all these things have been adjusting. Now, when I look at entrepreneurs, sometimes I look at tw in their 20s and 30s, they have blood pressures of people in their 70s. OK, mm -hmm. so there's a level of how we drive ourselves. What I want people to know is. I want to know whose measure of success you're following. 
Because from the moment we're born, we need other people and we ha- we are wired to need to belong. And so if you are, if you're bought into the mental co-creation we have in the world, that's faster is better, do more with less, profit over people, success requires struggle, all of these beliefs, if you're wired into that, you're going to be on a treadmill moving really fast and you're not even taking your biology into account. You're on the world's idea of what success looks like. IPO, going public, you know, cashing out of your business. I don't know what it is. But you want to ask yourself, are these my goals? Or have I just gone into this whole societal belief of what success is? What is your mission? And hold on to that is what I'd say. So exhaustion. Now, you've been exhausted for a while. You've been coping using these mechanisms. Your body's been coping. And then something comes in that's like a undertow, cynicism. It's that thought in your mind that just kind of creeps in and goes, doesn't matter how hard I work. I'm never going to really make a difference here. It's when you start to undermine your own exhaustion by not believing anymore. And sometimes you might even feel isolated from others, but you don't have the energy to engage. So you socially distance yourself, even though you're lonely. Mm-hmm. And lastly, you, you become ineffective. And that was me that day where I'm, the nurse is asking me, you know, I'm asking her the same question over and over again. So exhaustion, cynicism, some depersonalization, distancing, and ineffectiveness. That's the definition of burnout. There's phases you go through. The first phase of burnout is the alarms alarm phase where you jump on a treadmill and you're you're kind of working really fast because you got new funding, you got a new round, right? Whatever's going on. Well, if you stay on that treadmill and even turn up the speed, our bio- our biology is not meant for that. You move into something called chronic adaptation, where now you're using every strategy possible and you're hanging on. Then one more thing happens. And you go sliding down the slippery slope of burnout to ineffectiveness and exhaustion. So there's three, uh, the triad of burnout, exhaustion, cynicism, and ineffectiveness. And there's three phases you go through. The alarm phase, Mm -hmm. which the body can handle. You keep on that too long, chronic adaptation, and then exhaustion. So tell me where you are. Where are you right now? I'm I'm taking, I'm taking notes. This is, this is great. (laughs) Um, No, it's, it's interesting because I, you know, and and my listeners know, I mean, I'm, this show and my book and my life's work at this point is really trying to solve for the optimum way to be in the world that creates the highest probability of an existence or a reality or a, a lifestyle or whatever you know people sort of want to label it. Uh, it's it's the way of being in the world that creates the highest probability of the outcome that is the least likely to result in regret. Like in a nutshell, that's what I that's what my my day to day work is. That's why I evangelize entrepreneurship. It's not because hey, you know, there's 31 million businesses give or take in the United States, and gosh darn it, we need 10 million more, so I need to recruit some more entrepreneurs. I th- th- I I have basically through a lot of like both quantitative and qualitative work in my own experience, but a lot of um, sort of informal, uh, but quasi scientific analysis and large samples. I mean, I've had almost 300,000 students come through my education platform that have taken quizzes and, you know, we try to be as empirical as we can, not being a research institute. Um, I've got, you know, a, a real passion and a pretty large data set around like, what what is it that people say they want with their life and what are the practical mechanisms in a life that actually increase the probability of achieving what we say we want and reduce the likelihood of of you know landing where we don't want to and thus having regret because we're running out of time like that's it and i have i've you know there's no one size fits all but in terms of the 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 mechanisms that operate on self entrepreneurship is about as close as I've come to a one size fits all, you know, forge for that version of us, not for the outcome, not for the size of the business, not for the, the IPO, just the version of ourselves. Yeah. Well, you have Uh, to know what matters to you and you have to know what's worth, you know, going through the fire for, because you're gonna, any place that you are not as strong, 
will be highlighted very quickly. Right. And then you got to surround yourself with people who are really good at that, or you got to value that, or you got to grow it in yourself. And I, I think entrepreneurship is that crucible. It is it is such a beautiful uh, space to grow and learn about yourself. Yeah, about and like a lot, like a, like some of what you're referencing, I think that the term itself has been somewhat misappropriated and in some ways s sterilized, like we tend to do as a society is we want to like reductively distill things into simple compartmental labels so that we can, you know, taxonomize the whole world and put everything in its place. And we say right. entrepreneur now, and, you know, we conjure up an image of the magazine and it's probably some Silicon Valley billionaire on the front looking <laughs> ri rich and like a nerd that, you know, got cooler than the jocks that used to pick on them. I mean, that's what we think of, right? The word entrepreneur just, it translates to the, it's a French word that roughly translates to the word adventurer. It's a way of being. It's a value orientation. It's a again. It's a it's a like it's a way of being that you try to optimize your life around. It's it doesn't have anything to do it in 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 the grandest sense. It doesn't have anything to do even with starting a business. Yep. It's actually it's like and we living have living your best life. Yeah, and I have a, you know I have a whole theology that's basically built around it. And we don't need to go into that. But you asked where I'm at right now. The reason I set all that up is is I am. In trying to be, you know, let's say the honor roll of my own teaching, uh, of my own evangelism, I've tried to construct a life that is theoretically pretty well insulated from burnout, because mm. that's like literally what I'm trying to do is optimize I, for for life operating principles that get people where they want to go in as non-disrupt, you know, in, in as predictable as a way as possible. So that was a long way of saying that I actually, I don't think I deal with burnout. I'm dealing with burnout in a chronic sense, but I am having a hell of a bad day. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's, it's a day when it's challenging me to realize that even though I've spent, you know, the better part of a decade obsessed with this focus of installing systems and processes and external mechanisms to create this way of being for myself that, you know, blah, 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 it still needs work. It it, it still has breakdowns. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's beyond maintenance. Like today is a day where it is actually breaking down. And so, but here's it, here's my, uh, my observation, and this may sound like total victim talk. It's breaking down. When I try to pinpoint what's actually going on today, it's because I don't have all the people around me fully enrolled in operating the way I'm trying to operate. Because they all bring their own stuff to the table and they this isn't their life's obsession and they've got their own screaming kids or whatever they're dealing with. And so to some degree, these systems only work when more than when multiple people are voluntarily enrolled in in creating systems that are the alternative to the mainstream way, which to quote my last podcast guest, um, uh, who is an AI researcher, he said after in doing eight years of research for his book about systems, he said, most people agree that that they hate the way most things work. Mm. But that's the, that's actually the establishment. The establishment is an aggregate of people disliking what's going on around them but feeling helpless to change it. Mm. And the but the only way you create an effective alternative path is not to go it alone, it's to enroll other people in a willingness to try something new too. And it's day on days like today I feel that dissonance where like I'm trying to do it this way but I'm zigging and a lot of people are zagging to the norm and it tears things apart. So so there's almost a cold start problem here of like, mm. like if you, let's say you come up with, and maybe you already have, this is the perfect system to not get burned out for an individual. Mm. Is that system even doable in a world where other people are not also, have not also agreed to participate in that system? Hey there, real quick, I just wanted to let you know, I have been concentrating a lot lately on providing tons of value to my text message community. This could be random thoughts, this could be letting you be the first to know about an event I'm planning or a special I'm running or a free training I'm hosting. Anyway, just shoot me a text to get subscribed. The number is 702-996-3926. Thanks so much, let's get back to the podcast. Well, what I'd say is my goal has never been not to burn out. Mm. I have, for 20 years, I have 
investigated myself, investigated human behavior, treated th- tens of thousands of patients and physicians and healthcare systems and corporate environments, organizations. I don't know that I would tell you, I, I would tell you that I'm an all or none person. When I do something, I go all in. I want it to be excellent. I value excellence. I think what's happened over these 20 years is that I recognize that pattern in myself sooner and sooner. And when I fall off, because I just launched a book, I fell off launching a book on burnout. And when I fell off the horse, I recognized right away what was happening. And I recalibrated, made changes, used the tools that I teach, and got right back on. So to me, it's not about never experiencing it. It's about me knowing myself well enough that I pick up the signs really early and I can recalibrate. And so I don't know that there'll be a time that I I don't, you know, when I get passionate about things, I just, it it takes me over emotionally. And then I'm like, let's do that. That's going to be amazing. It's going to make such a big impact. I, I don't ever want to lose that part of me. Yeah. But... That also sometimes has me overestimating what I am capable of and that I do need to ask for help. And then I, and so I've learned these things about myself. Sometimes I pick the wrong partners and I find myself doing everything, feeling resentful. And I'm like, oh, net energy drain, Neha. Now I pick it up just like that. And I'm like, okay, now we're going to, we're going from, you know, the way I say it is from burned out to fully charged at work and in life. And as soon as I'm, I'm off the dark green into the yellow. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. New choices. Where's the leak in energy? Rerouting. So I, my thing is, my thought is that as an adventurer, as an entrepreneur in life, what's so cool about that is you're walking into the unknown over and over and over again. And how cool that you have the self-trust to walk in even when it's messy, even when you're zigging and other people are zagging especially when that's happening. And then it's mm-hmm. about what are the regrounding? How quickly can you figure out where you're losing energy and what you need to do to recalibrate? And so I think what I'd say is I learned at the bedside in my 20s, everyone was like in Europe and backpacking and you know doing all sorts of fun, fun, cool stuff. I was sitting at the bedside of people who were dying. And as a 20 something year old doctor, they were speaking to me about what actually mattered. I think I got the secret to the end of the game. And what I learned was the money we chase, the the titles we chase, the cars, the neighborhood, the people, the fame, the likes, like none of it matters. When everything ends, they talk to you about a couple things. Number one, was I loved? Number two, did I love well? Number three, Did I make an impact? And if so, what kind of an impact? And number four, do I have any regrets? And those regrets were not about things that they tried and failed. They never spoke about those. They spoke about what they did not have the courage to try. When their fear and their own selves stopped them from the courage to take a risk. And what I really appreciate about you is it can be a hard day and people can be zagging while you're zigging and you're going to get up and you're going to walk in and you're going to walk into the unknown of that frustration, of that discomfort, of that overwhelm, and you're going to do it again and you're going to figure out how to get back on that horse. And so I would not say that I figured out the secret to it, but I will tell you when you have The self-awareness, when you understand your own body's physiology, like constriction, stomach turning, how your body's talking to you early, when you can pick up the clues and the patterns early, you're going to have days like this. And it's going to be about, does your mind tell your body, oh, like this is awful, what is going on? Or, Or like, I'll give you an example. I gained weight, 15 pounds while I was writing this book. Now it's time to go on tour and I can't button up my favorite pants. Okay. And I'm like, oh, you're, oh my God, you're this, you're fat. Like, what are you doing? You're not even going to look good in all the photography and blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
So this thought goes through my mind. I thought, wow. So Neha, you were busy drinking coconut milk chai. You were busy eating all sorts of sugar and things to write the book. Your body was so gracious that it expanded to absorb the stress you couldn't. And now you're beating it up. So now what I changed my mental talk was, thank you, body, for expanding to absorb the stress that I couldn't. As soon as I can, I'll take over. And I did. Like, it's kind of a miracle. But when we divide from ourselves, then we're in trouble. But if we're kind to ourselves, like for you, as you go through this feeling of overwhelm or frustration, the other piece on this is control. And when do we, yes, we want the world to work in a certain way and we're creating this whole system. And when it doesn't, who are we in those moments? Yeah. Because even that is when we can sometimes divide it with others. And really what we need to do is kind of figure out where's that place to surrender and kind of move within us, right? That allows us to stay connected, forgive, surrender, like become the water around the rock because we have our mission that is much bigger. We've got that inside us. So I I love the, first of all, you're, I know you already are a speaker, but you should be a speaker because you <laughs> Well, I'm glad I do that for a living because I you really say, love it. I really do say, love it. You say you, you say beautiful words and you say them melodiously. But um, no, I uh, what I took out of everything you were saying, I love that you were talking about. I mean, b- bittersweet to say, I love that you were talking about the exper- experiences with the dying. Um, I think about this a lot. I was uh, there was a, I think it's the most. Uh, popular interview or podcast episode uh tim ferris ever did was with a guy i want to say uh bj something i can't remember his last name i keep wanting to say bj oh, Novak. bj but... wasserman did he yeah I, he was yeah he's the wasserman? death and dying he's a doctor uh, yeah yeah yep and um i listened to his and he was uh he was badly burned when he was younger and anyway really interesting but that ever since i listened to that interview i've 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 you know anytime i see a study or uh, a book or an expert around experiences with the dying or experiences with the wisdom of people in later stages of life, I always clue into it because again, my my detention that I really, I'm like, I don't know why, it, it, I'd probably just need to go to a shrink and figure it out, but like, why do I care so much that we tend to be such short-term thinkers? Actually, I, I know the reasons, they just don't matter right now, they're too biographical, but this long-term thinking is, is for me, is everything. And so, uh, when you're talking about the early alarm system, I mean, you ask what where I'm at with it. I'm probably, you know, today I'm having an early alarm system. And, and I think I've done a decent job in my life of installing a pretty good perimeter security system that my alarms get tripped pretty early while there's yeah. some time to respond. But here's here's kind of the 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 keystone to my thinking about all of this is I've been really, really ruminating a lot lately on a on a concept um called liminality, which, you know, liminal, it's like the study of boundaries or thresholds, right? When we're crossing from one stage into another. Yeah. And so I I, I want to share with you um, sort of a hypothesis I have that is, and again, this is, I think this is true of literally what I'm doing in the world is a, a number of hypothesi- hypotheses and attempts to validate them about how to orient ourselves in the present to create the highest probability of a desirable future for ourselves individually. You know, and a lot of scientists are worried about how to how to do that for us as a collective. I'm obsessively focused on how to do it as an individual, which is a totally different study. But in any case, this concept of liminality. I so here's something I observed um, in all child development theory, whether you go to like Erickson or Pia, uh, Piaget or uh, well, Erickson actually extended over the course of a life, or you go to Jung or you go to Adler or whatever. There's always these different stages, and people think differently maybe about what those stages are. But this is what I noticed is that almost, I think this is an absolutely true maxim, in all of the stage models of human development, the subsequent stage is longer than the previous stage. So you use like Erickson's model of psychosocial development, and the first stage is like 18 months, the next stage is two years, the next stage is two years, the next stage is like five years, the next stage is like six years, and now we're 18, and then the next year is like 20 years, and now we're at midlife, and then the next year stage is 25, and now we're retiring, and then 
presuming we live long enough, the next stage could be 30 or 40 years. And then the next stage is forever, depending on your spiritual beliefs. <laughs> right? So, yeah. so, so approaching it from a concept of, of liminality, where it's like thinking of every moment and the, and the present is the ultimate manifestation of liminality in that the present does is no thing. It's simply the threshold, but it's that which is after the past and before the future. That's right. And so, so if every moment is this liminal threshold that is punctuated by thresholds between stages and every stage constantly gets longer and thus more impactful and thus ultimately more definitive of the totality of our experience, yeah. then, then the goal of life in many ways should be try to try to pull the reality or the profundity or the the focus or or the lesson of the of of the the bigger stages into the present shorter stages all the time as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And wow. so this is why faith to me is really important and I'm not here to to preach but if you believe in in an eternal some eternal you know beingness of 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 life well then everything else starts to pale in comparison and so whether you do or not the, the, the reason I bring up the stages of life is it actually doesn't matter if you believe in an afterlife, even if you only take the time bound uh, living stages, it's still true that the next stage is longer than the current stage. So it's like, I should be trying to pull through to the present that which will be true for me in the future as much as possible. That's why I'm so interested in, in the experiences of the dying because that's the mm. best insight we have. Yeah. And they all say the same things. The last stage of psychosocial development is ego integrity versus despair. It's, it's, it's everything you just described. And so, I I'm I feel like tell me if you agree with this. I'm sort of connecting two theories here. But to some degree burnout is when we've been so dominated by the tyranny of the urgent present that we have allowed our present existence to be uh overwhelmed with reactive urgency and to no longer be attending to that which will turn out to be to have been timelessly more important than whatever was important in the present. Mm. I know that was a lot of words, but at least it did, did it make sense and did it land? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I think there's a piece in here of the ways we've adapted to unhealed trauma. Like for me, mm -hmm. when I was young, I had abandonment. And so I became quite a people pleaser. So I said yes to a lot of things. So I would never have to feel the pain of that unhealed trauma again. Just don't leave me. Don't leave me. I'll do anything you want me to do, but like, don't leave me. So I made myself indispensable, not only to my parents, the Indian community, society. I mean, you become a doctor, people need you, right? right. And so I think there's a part of it also of unhealed wounds that lead us to patterns of being and behaving in the world that until we slow down and really kind of allow ourselves to reveal, feel, and heal them, we will be running in patterns that are subconscious to us. And we need to slow down. We need to listen to podcasts like this. We need to expand our perspective so that we can become more resourceful in a world moving faster and faster by the minute. Yes. I, I feel like I love that expansion of what I was saying. I'm 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 interested in the cynicism piece within that that triad definition. That's really interesting to me because you're right. I mean, if I just personalize it, I, I do fancy myself a pretty tough cookie. Like I can take a lot. I can I can bear a lot. But you're right. The moment exhaustion isn't the crack for me. Because I'm tired. I go to sleep. I wake up. I do it again. The cynicism is the crack. That's it is. What it's, you you know it's getting to you. And it's so, like you're dividing against yourself. The yes. moment your mind is the undertow, now you're walking on the beach and all of a sudden you can feel the sand going out underneath you. That's the moment where the exhaustion isn't going to be able to stand. Exactly. So, so yeah. So as I'm trying to solve for this or, or sort of adapt your methodology here, which I, 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 I honestly, I say this to like virtually every guest on the show is like, I can't wait to read your book. And then the reality is I've had 300 episodes and I have not read all 300 books, but um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, you'll know, uh, you'll know when uh, it's the right time. Yeah, no, I mean, a recipe for burnout I, here. I, I definitely want to have my team read the book. I know that. Um, and I, and I want to too, but, but the cynicism piece, 
especially because I work I I I work in the hopes and dreams business in a lot of ways. I mean, people come into Entre Institute because they're at a, very often they're at a point of burnout, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Hey, you know, practically something needs to give." And we 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 you know we teach them new skills and new career possibilities and new life operating system and all this stuff. But that cynicism piece, that's the real toxin that I think keeps people from surrendering or committing or going all in to whatever the actual solution, the long, the long medicine, not the short-term medicine, the long-term medicine should act could actually be for most people. The reason they don't take it or or evolve to it is is cynicism so often. So that's I'm curious, of all that we've talked about, do you, does that piece hold a particular place in your in your methodology as something that like we have to really really solve for? Yeah, and I'll I'll give you uh, afterwards. I'll give you something you can post in the show notes where people can do a pulse check to figure out where they are from burned out to fully charged at work and in life. Do they have a net gain or a net drain of energy on a physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual level? Mm. The moment. So what I say when they're filling it out is. You can answer from here, answer questions, but that's not the answer. The answer is, if you're saying, yeah, I get enough sleep, I'm fine, sleep is fine. But when you're filling out that answer, you have constriction, heaviness, tightness in your body, the answer is net drain. Because when we separate, like the cynicism, when we're, it's like that tide, right? The undertow, when you're going against yourself, you're not gonna win. So. I say to them, your mind and how you answer the questions, as well as your body, is it open, light, and relaxed, net gain of energy? Is it constricted, heavy, tight, net drain of energy? So you have to align your body with your answers. And if they're at odds with each other, it's a net drain. And that's the undertow. So as you're going through this, it's like a, it'll take 20, you know, 15 minutes and your team can all do it, but I'll give you that. We can put it in the show notes, but it's called the burnout awareness, the prescription for the uh, awareness prescription for burnout. And I think it'll be really useful for everybody to figure out where they're having that undertow hmm. because it absolutely is the game change. Okay. So Neha, in the interest of time, because I know that we've uh, basically just run out of it. Let's let's wind this down. Um, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to invite the audience to come. Like I, I feel like all we've done is scratch the surface here in, in a lot of ways. I don't know. I'm my energy is you say listen to your body. My body wants us to talk for like eight more hours. But um well, I'll where come can back the, again. No worries. Yeah. I'd be happy to come back again. Honestly, I, I hope I, I will take you up on that and let's do it. But I know in the interest of time, I need to release you. So tell the audience where they can go to get more of this goodness and we'll, then we'll uh, we'll come back for a part two. Sure. Intuitive Intelligence Inc., like an INC dot com. So intuitive intelligence inc dot com. And for you to get your very own burnout assessment with a six video series there with me talking you through the whole thing, it's intuitive intelligence inc dot com forward slash burnout hyphen rx, like prescription, burnout mm -hmm. prescription. Um my latest book is Powered by Me, From Burned Out to Fully Charged at Working in Life. You can get that anywhere you get books. And I also wrote a book on leaning into healthy conflict, and that's called Talk RX: Five Steps to Honest Conversations that Create Connection, Health, and Happiness. So yeah, I'd love it. My name is Neha Sangwan, and um, you can follow me on social uh, at, at, and spell out the word doctor, at D-O-C-T-O-R-N-E-H-A or on LinkedIn at Neha Sangwan, MD. Amazing. Uh, Neha, thank you so much for being a guest. Uh, it sounds like we have a whole other set of conversations uh, around conflict. Uh, sure. I, I, because I know they're all, they're all interrelated. Um, but r right now I'm going to let you go. I know you have somewhere else you need to be, but thank you so much for being a guest on Unlock Your Potential. It's been wonderful. What a joy. Thanks. Great to meet you, Jeff. And to all you viewers and listeners out there, you're the best part of this show. You're why I do it every time. Can't wait to see you next time. Thanks so much. If you loved that episode, then you're definitely gonna love this one. Check it out. Pleasure and pain work like opposite sides of a balance. When we experience pleasure, the way that our brains get us back to the level position is first by tipping to the side of pain. As we become addicted, we are compulsively pursuing our drug in the total absence of joy.